So today is the final session, which we're all sad about. Um, but we're going to hear from uh, first Shelly is going to review the assignments. And um, then I'm going to talk briefly about uh, identifying a study section, requesting a study study section. Um, and then uh, Annalisa is going to talk about reviewers and um, the review process. Roland will talk about uh, formatting and um, graphics. And well, actually, Annalisa goes before you do. I was going to say, I may have had the order yeah. of most of that wrong. <laughs> But uh, <laughs> here we go. So first we are, oh, and here it is. All right, assignment review. We're going to um, kick it off with Shelly. Okay, so um, I looked over the, um, the specific, specific aims and the work draft from everybody. Um, in general, everybody did a really good job on the significance and innovation, making sure to point out your things. Just one thing to note, if you could um, just be more specific about your problem, like for instance, if you were developing a rapid test for uh, sepsis, you know, it would be good to say, you know, what the problem is and how many, you know, the deaths that occur from sepsis, but it would be better to also say one of the key factors in survival is the time it takes to diagnose the patient and begin therapy because you're pointing out what your application is. So if you can point out in your significance what your application is addressing, that makes it um, more powerful. Um, I said, don't overdo the technical details or underrepresent the big picture in your specific aims. Your specific aims, you want to show them overall what you're doing and how it fits in. You don't need to go into um, all of the technical details in your specific aims. You want to make sure you are giving them the big picture of how your technology fits and how it's going to address the significance of the problem. Um, oh, make sure most of you did this, but there was a couple that didn't. Make sure you pull out your specific aims. So enumerate them, bullet point them, but pull them out separately. Don't put them in the paragraph. Make sure they're easy for them to find because they want to see that right away. Um, go ahead to the next one. Um, so this was um, the specific aims in the work plan, like in general, I just kind of put the two of them together. Make sure, I did see from several, a couple of you for sure, that looked like you had more work than I think is going to be feasible in the time period of a phase one. So your phase one is six to 12 months and somewhere around 300000 of a budget. Don't propose more work than you're going to be able to do in that period. You will get nailed on that. So make sure your work is geared toward a phase one goal. Um, make sure that all of your aims are directed towards proving feasibility. I did see a couple of them that looked like more um, maybe marketing or commercialization activities. Make sure this is a phase one, you're showing feasibility of your product. So make sure your aims are geared towards that. Um, do include, I, we talked last time about putting um, measurable aims. So here's a good example from Clearvoya. They said, um, our goal is to achieve an inference speed of 0.1 seconds on the images. That's great. They gave a very specific measurable goal for that aim. So as much as you can put measurable goals for your aims. Um, also in your work plan, you do want to include your rationale for sample size. They, I've seen, other people uh, criticized for this before. They don't want to see that you chose to do eight mice because that's what fit in your budget. They want to see a rationale for what your sample size is. So for instance, Exomira had um, a power calculation that showed why eight mice was going to give them the statistical results that they wanted. So you do want to support your decisions for your sample size. They are going to want to see that. Um, one other thing that I forgot to put in my review, but um, most of you had in your specific aims had uh, literature citations. That's great. I, you definitely need them. You're definitely going to want to cite the literature. I do want to make sure everybody knows that those citations, eventually they will go in a separate uh, bibliography. And amazingly, this is one of the things that NIH actually doesn't specify. They let you pick your format. So whatever your favorite standard format for your citations is, is fine but they're not included in your space of either your one page specific aims or your six pages for your work plan. Um, they go in a separate thing. So I think those were all the main points that I pulled out. Yeah, the one thing that I would add to that is um, 
on the specific aims. Think in terms of what the technology itself will do, not what you will do as an activity to develop the technology. I, I've seen a few aims that say, you know, we will develop, we will scale up, we will do this. That's your activity, but that's not the specific aim. The specific aim is what the technology itself will accomplish, the performance parameters. Chris, did you have anything? Um, no, I think you guys did an awesome job. I would say that make sure your technical aims are te slightly technical in nature and not just kind of basic research. And um, on the um, rationalization for sample size, they also, not so much in your specific aims, but you will have to rationalize why you selected a particular animal model, especially as you get towards large animal models. Um, if you do dog, there certainly be a reviewer that says, oh, you should have done pig. So make sure you specify why you chose that model. Oh, a, a quick note to my teams. I have not completed my homework review from last week. So I, that's in the queue. I will do that. You'll be getting that shortly. But my, my comments on your assignment from last week aren't available yet. Don't be alarmed. You'll get them. I'm alarmed. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> Just teasing. Okay. Are, are we kicking it over to uh, Annalisa now? I think yep, we're going with Annalisa. Okay, I'm going to stop sharing. Great, I'm actually, let's see if I can share the screen here one second. All right. Well, thanks for having me. Uh, I realized that I'm coming in at the tail end of the party here, and I'm sad that I missed all the fun that came before the, you know, in the, in the previous days, but, you know, hopefully the slides that I'm gonna go over in the short amount of time that I have will, will be just as fun. So. For, for those of you who don't know me, um, I'm Annalisa Samara, um, and I've been working with early stage companies for about 17 years, wearing many different hats, VC tech transfer, starting and selling my own device company. But I've also been involved with SBIRs actually since 2008 um, and have, have, have helped companies get over 50 million um, in that type of financing. I'm a um, NIH PI, uh, phase one, phase two fast track, as well as an NSF phase one, phase two uh, PI. And I'm a re reviewer over the NSF side. Um, so I thought uh, for today, I could share, um, you know, a bit about the review process on the NIH side, um, as well as my own perspective, and then um, go into some common uh, pitfalls uh, for uh, the application. So, if I can just start here, just so everyone is aware of the timeline. I don't know if you all are aware of this, but, you know, it kind of takes a while for the, you know, application uh, to get funded from the time of submission. I always tell, uh, you know, companies that I work with, you know, it's, it's probably about, you know, six, seven month process, maybe more depending on what you're doing, especially if you're doing things like a clinical trial, which uh, may require um, you know, things like IRB approval, or in the case, if you have a medical device, depending on the labeling, like ID approval, that sort of thing. So it takes a while uh, between, you know, uh, the time you submit and the time you award. And in between that is the all important part of the review process. So there are two levels uh, of review. Uh, the first level is a small business study section review, which one of my colleagues here will go over um, in a bit. Um, but, you know, the main thing that happens during the first level of re review is the scoring. So um, the, the, the way that these grants are scored um, is interesting. Um, it, there's different categories um, that, that comprise a score and the scoring is, is goes uh, depending on the subcategories from one to nine with one being the, the, the best score, nine being the worst. Um, and the total, the final score ranges anywhere between 10 um, being the best possible score you can get. I've seen that happen a couple of times with some Illinois based companies and that's awesome uh, to 90, uh, which is the worst. Um, and then there are also uh, grants that uh, don't get scored. And in that case, it, they're called not discussed. Um, so after the first level of review, um, the applications uh, then uh, move on to um, the second level of review, which is the advisory council review. Um, and the, the grants uh, that are considered for funding are those that fall within a funding range. Um, each institute uh, within the NIH has, you know, their own, uh, you know, uh, fundable range, uh, you know, it differs. So uh, at the advisory council level, they dis discuss things uh, 
such as the uh, technical merit of the proposal um, as discussed in the first level of review. Um, they also consider things about like uh, how much money they actually have uh, to fund um, you know, the, the well-scored application. And then they also really look at how well the well-scored applications match to um, their program priorities. So there's a lot of things um, that they consider uh, during the council meeting, which happens, uh, you know, uh, later, uh, long after you, you know, submit the application. But a lot can happen in between the first and second level of review. You know, if you score really well, um, you know, uh, in some institutes, it can be, you know, 30 or lower, for instance, uh, you know, you may get a request for just-in-time information, things like, um, you know, and then with that includes, you know, an updated budget, um, updated current and pending support pages. In the case of the clinical trials, if you're doing that, IRB approvals, IACUC approvals, uh, that sort of thing. And depending on the SBIR, there, there might be special SBIRs that require um, even more just-in-time information. I've seen some applications that have a regulatory focus and they want to see things like um, meeting minutes from an FAA meeting. So in terms of the actual, um, you know, review criteria um, that kind of make up the scoring, this bulleted list here kind of goes through the different categories um, that the reviewers consider. They look at things like the significance, um, you know, what exactly is the unmet need that you're addressing. Um, they look at things like, you know, the investigator, this is the most important person in the application. This is the captain of the ship. Um, essentially, the reviewers want to have confidence that the investigator, the primary, the PI uh, has, uh, you know, the experience um, to, you know, successfully lead the project. They look at things like, you know, the innovation. They want to make sure that this technology is revolutionary, not evolutionary. They look at um, detail of the strategy, the methodology and analysis that you put together in the approach. And then finally, they look at the environment. So this is the, you know, support, um, uh, like personnel, resources, things you have access to, to successfully lead the project. Um, there might be other things that uh, the reviewers look for depending on the phase, as well as, the, you know, the kind of, uh, if there's a special solicitation for the SBIR, so they may look at things like the, you know, human subjects protections, the vertebrate animal plan, and other documents that are listed um, on the call. So now I want to transition to some of the common pitfalls and mistakes um, that, uh, you know, applicants have when, you know, they uh, are, you know, aren't, aren't fortunate, uh, you know, to get, uh, you know, funding uh, from the NH for the proposal. And right here kind of have, you know, five things. Um, certainly there are more, but these are the five that, you know, kind of stand out to me. Um, and I'll go through them individually. So to begin with, um, you know, if the application focuses on a lack of innovation, that's a huge thing. Um, I keep hearing this a lot um, and read, read this a lot when I look at um, some statements and reviews that, you know, they, they want the technology to be more revolutionary as opposed to, a, you know, evolutionary type project. They don't want to fund things that are incremental improvement to existing technologies. If that were the case, um, you know, you might uh, get funding uh, through, you know, angel mechanisms or, you know, bank loan, but, you know, the NIH doesn't fund, um, uh, you know, kind of incremental improvements on existing tech. Um, they also, the reviewers also consider, you know, what other competition is out there. Uh, you know, uh, if, you know, if you do not go into an analysis of, you know, other tech, compared to yours, you know, they may look on their own and call that out. So you have to, you know, kind of be proactive on that and, um, you know, state how you are better uh, than existing competition, whether it's pre-market or at market. Um, another pitfall is that, you know, I've seen a number of applications actually have no references. That's a huge mistake. Have references both um, on the you know research strategy as well as the commercialization plan. Um, on the research strategy, you want to make sure that you reference uh, you know key uh, you know key opinion leader uh, research in the field. Um, some of them might be in your study section. Um, if you have your own work, that's important to you know reference your own publications uh, too. And then finally, um, you know this is you know often uh, overlooked, but it's important to you you know, uh, include citations in your commercialization plan, because I've seen some reviews, uh, some, re some summary statements um, from reviewers that say, you know, thought that, um, you know, some assumptions, some market numbers um, you were kind of made up. So they want to know your sources for that. So be sure to include that. Um, there, another big problem, um, you know, 
uh, with uh, the, the grants and, and I want to focus on kind of like the research strategy. Um, you know, Shelley talked about, you know, quantitative success criteria. That is super important. I see that so many times in applications that don't get funded. If you do not have quantitative criteria for success, you've already turned off the reviewer. Um, be sure to include also a rationale for each aim. Um, you know, uh, make sure that your, um, you know, your the aims uh, have, you know, detailed um, kind of like the methodology. Um, I've seen, you know, some applications that don't get funded that provide kind of like a summary, um, you know, for each aim, like of the experiments. And, you know, oftentimes reviewers get, you know, too turned off if the detail isn't there. Um, try not to be, you know, overly ambitious um, in your application. Um, consider the time frame that you're proposing for the project, and make sure that you're able to uh, achieve those goals within that time frame. After all, these are your peers, and they may be able to, they might call you out on trying to do too much in a small amount of time. And then finally, I think Rowan or someone here is going to go over kind of like formatting, but you know, I think it's important to. Um, you know, format your application uh, so that it's easy to read. You know, these reviewers are reviewing a whole lot of applications and you want to make sure that your, um, you know, research strategy is uh, sectioned off, right? So that it has, you know, key things that the reviewers are looking for. Um, and then the other thing that I want to go over is, um, you know, another uh, pitfall in application is really a focus on the team. Um, you know, the most important person I mentioned earlier is the PI. Uh, you know, the, the reviewers look at the, you know, the biosketch to make sure that the PI um, has enough in their biosketch to give them confidence that this person can successfully lead the project. Um, in addition to the PI, they look at the rest of the team uh, to see, you know, if there is, you know, specific know-how to address, you know, the different aims. Um, ideally, these people would be employed by the company. Um, and then uh, you know, the other thing that the uh, reviewers look for in terms of the team is they'd like to also spot any gaps in knowledge. So, you know, if you're, you know, proposing, um, you know, something uh, with a statistical plan, they wonder if you have a statistician on board, even in a consultancy, um, you know, uh, on a consultancy basis. Um, if you are uh, working in a uh, particular uh, clinical field, they want to see that that clinical expertise is uh, represented uh, in the team, whether as an employee, a consultant, or, you know, an investigator on a, on a sub board. So that's, I know that's kind of a lot that I kind of crammed in, in uh, the short amount of time. But, um, you know, I think before we move on, um, we do have uh, someone here in, in the audience um, who is also uh, an NIH reviewer, uh, you know, Samir Ansari. I don't know if you're here, I can't tell, but if you have any, you know, thoughts you wanted to add um, as an NIH reviewer, you know, feel free. Hi, I'm here with uh, my, my partner in Clearvoya. But yeah, we, um, the NIH review process, I, I think it's very similar to actually uh, grants that we review, uh, except phase two trials uh phase two uh, applications uh, there is a commercialization uh, component that is graded uh, for uh, a commercialization plan but otherwise it it, it follows a similar format on uh, significance your scientific premise of of your ra or rationale of why this is going to be important um, of course your approach which is your your scientific uh, uh, methodology of uh, proving that your concept uh, is going to be viable and also can um, go to market uh, has some uh, has the, uh, evidence behind it that, that you're able to prove uh, uh, in with a statistical plan and research methodology uh, with your based on your specific aims and um, then innovation uh, environment and then the investigators the you know applications have gotten so so uh, competitive that almost all uh, investigators are well well rounded that they, they have um, good publications they have a track record um, the environment is often the institution that they're at so obviously some institutions might get a slightly higher score than others but uh, often that's given a pass by most reviewers um, as long as the investigators are good and your team your of co-investigators uh, has a good supportive environment uh, and then uh, your innovation, uh, obviously, that's uh, where where you you may actually excite uh, the uh, reviewers for, towards a better overall impact score. And so, the overall impact score, you know, it certainly takes components of uh, each of these. I think probably the significance and the approach are probably the more 
two most important ones that I usually look at. If those are solid, then then typically the impact will be good. But if the innovation is not there, then certainly that, that can hurt you. Uh, if there's a really strong in a innovative um, uh, methodology or innovative uh, application or new technology, then that can certainly uh, drive an overall, overall impact score better than uh, each of the individual scores in those sections. So um, that's how I look, I look at it. I've reviewed for SBI or SDTRs once, but mostly uh, for R01 uh, applications. Uh, in Samir, can you say a little bit about what the process is like and the interaction among the reviewers? When, when you read reviews, obviously there's contention among the reviewers. That's healthy, that's good. Yes. But, you know, what is that like from the reviewer standpoint? How do they handle contention? What is the role of the program manager? Can you talk a little bit about that aspect of the experience? Yeah, so typically three reviewers are, are assigned an application and um, uh, there's a lead in time uh, for the your review and you're not really, you don't really have access to any other reviewers comments or um, uh, or review and you, and you and you formulate your written review ahead of time prior to the to the study section um, and then uh, a day or two uh, before the study section you are allowed to then uh, have access to the other reviewers comments so I'll often go and and see what I may have missed or maybe I didn't pay attention or uh, or maybe I'm, I'm gonna disagree and advocate for that application uh, in certain areas where I feel there is a strength where the other reviewers may have missed or Maybe it's a certain expertise of mine that they may not understand or vice versa. And so I think that's where you start to develop your, your uh, concept on the grant, whether uh, your original score was accurate, uh, whether it needs to be up, up regulated or down regulated. Uh, so it, you, you, you see a lot of that ahead of time. And then at the study section, um, there's a primary reviewer and then a secondary and tertiary reviewer. And the primary reviewer will typically present that to the group uh, in a four to five minute uh, presentation uh, in basically following the same criteria that I outlined, and uh, uh, the depend you know on the score, the score and the score and the final overall impact score and the score, uh, and then the second and third reviewer will also give a two three minute uh, either they will agree or disagree and and then and then there's a conversation primarily among the three reviewers, um, uh, but uh, anybody on the study section can certainly weigh in if they have a certain, if they looked at the grant or if they uh, have comments or a certain expertise in that area. May I ask a question? Oh, sure. Uh, so this is June from Northwestern. So um, I've been commonly reviewed our grant, uh, but I'm very confused after hearing uh, what Anna presented. So what's the difference between the uh, review criteria uh, about uh, SBBR or STTR, SBR or STTR business grant versus regular R's. To me, it sounds like very, very similar. Uh, that totally overlap with R21. So um, is there anything like make the STTR or SBIR a little bit differently reviewed, especially for phase one? This too, I understand from Donna that uh, they have a little bit of review criteria from the uh, you know, uh, business plan. So how about phase one? It sounds like very similar as R21. Thank you. Sure, you know, I can start off and you know, my colleagues can jump in it as well. Um, so, you know, it's similar in that uh, they, they look at the significance innovation approach, kind of like what, what Amir was talking about, but you know, the, the the content is very different in that it's very focused on, um, you know, a product that is is on the track for is on track for commercialization, right? So this isn't, um, this is, you know, this comes, uh, you know, after, um, you know, just kind of like it's not it's not basic research. Um, this is research that is, you know, towards. Um, the development and commercialization of, you know, product technology, that sort of thing. So um, you kind of have to, you know, kind of put on a sort of like a business hat, um, you know, the viewers do as, as, you know, as they're looking at the application to see if the, um, it has legs, uh, you know, to make it to the market. So it's, I guess it's less um, of a basic science review, but more of a, you know, kind of like product, you know, market kind of, you know, focused review. I don't know if any, any of my colleagues here want to add to that. Yeah, I, I think that's true. I think one thing that's important to remember is that um, 
reviewers don't receive a copy of the RFA when they get your proposal. Um, they don't have to have any special training and understanding the, the requirements of the SBIR, SCTR program. So the onus is really on you um, to convey those unique points to the reviewers in your proposal, um, to really draw a distinction. Um, and that's why we talked about in you know, the aim section, going beyond basic research and making sure that your aims are all moving the product toward commercialization. So it's clear to reviewers that there is an end goal here and that's into the market. Uh, so the onus really is on you as, as the author to, to convey those unique uh, factors. Yeah, I, I will say, and certainly the uh, SBI SCTR is, as Anna uh, mentioned, and it's a, it's, it's a technology transfer or a small business development uh, you know that is the main focus of the of the of the grant. Um, but like in R twenty one, it is very similar in the sense that there's no preliminary data required. There's no commercialization plan required. Uh, so the feasibility uh, really study can be can be part of a phase one trial. So uh, it is preliminary. Uh, phase two, of course, there is uh, preliminary data required. There is um, a commercialization plan required, which has specific components that. Um, I have an outline that I can go through, but I think most people here are phase one uh, oriented. I have a follow-up question on that, uh, the difference between our, our series grant and uh, STDR, SBIRs. The reviewer uh, composition are also uh, different, right? So, so for our series grants, invariably, they are all scientists with proper expertise. But with with the business grants, there are non scientists, but commercial uh, industry people. Is yeah. that right? Or yeah, yeah I, 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 that next. I'm sorry. Oh, okay. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, briefly. I mean, I, I yeah, I was on a study section for ours and for STTR SBIRs uh, on the science scientific side or on the medical clinical side. But um, there were on the STTR SBIR study sections, there are individuals who are. A corporate or who are who have um, gone through the process or uh, have business expertise. Yeah. And and an SBIR is an R mechanism, by the way. So it's an R4344. Um, so that's why it's similar, because it is literally an R mechanism. So that that's anyway. Yeah. yeah. And if I just wanted to add um, that, uh, you know, as Samir said, there are kind of like businessy folks, right? Uh, you know, on, on the review panel, but a lot of them um, are, you know, may have been co-founders with a scientific background. So they're kind of like business scientists. Um, I've never really seen like a pure, you know, business person as a reviewer. Maybe, you know, maybe, you know, they may exist on the review panel, but they're mostly, you know, scientists who are now hybrid uh, business scientist people. Right, entrepreneurial scientists, yeah. Yeah, exactly. Okay, well, unless there are any other sections, that's that's actually a good point to say, uh, unless there are any other questions, that's a good point to segue into selecting the review committee. Do we have any other questions before Chris proceeds? I'm going to set my timer so I don't go over. Okay, Roland. Sounds good. All right. So um, this is another one of those areas where I could like geek out all day. Um, but I'm going to give you really high level. And if anybody has any specific questions or wants to dive deeper, um, we can set up a one on one. But the Center for Scientific Review is who's responsible for assigning your proposal to a study section. It is one of the 27 institutes and centers at NIH. Remember, only 24 participate in SBIR, so they don't participate in it, but they organize the review process. They are organized differently than uh, ICs, institutes and centers, which are organized by body system or disease. Uh, and these are organized by scientific disciplines. So if you go to one research, uh, one institute or center, that's different than your study section. And I'm sharing my whole screen here because I want to toggle back and forth between um, the internet and my slides. So when you're talking about study sections, you have two choices. The first is to do nothing. And CSR will automatically assign your proposal to a study section. Nine times out of 10, they hit the nail on the head. Maybe 9.75 times out of 10, they hit the nail on the head. You have the opportunity to see what study section you're assigned to. You can raise a red flag if you need to. Most of the time, it's gonna be fine. If you want to request a study section, there's an optional form. That's the assignment request form where you request your, you can request your institute and center, your primary and secondary institutes or centers, um, or ones that you don't wanna be assigned to. Study sections, 
individuals who should not review your application, and then up to five general specific areas of scientific expertise that's required for your application. This is an optional form. So only, and you can select, you can just fill out one of those things or all of those things, totally up to you. Okay, so um, how do you decide which study section to request? Well, one great way to do that is with conversations with your program officer. Um, people always say like, well, what do I ask the program officer? This is a great question to ask them to give, um, to, but take some to them. Say, hey, I'm looking at these three study sections. Do you have any insight into which would be the best for this proposal? The other way is to use NIH's matchmaker, which is in the reporter system. Um, if you've never used that before, it's awesome. You can just enter keywords and you'll get abstracts of similar funded projects. Um, and those abstracts, they actually tell you what study section it was assigned to. So that's pretty helpful. And then the final way is to use um, CSR's website. And um, when you just, I mean, you can just Google NIH CSR. And this is the page you come to. And you want to make sure that you enter small business because uh, SBI or STTR has designated study sections. Um, and so they don't, you, you won't be able to, to access the full list of study sections. So you have to enter SBI or small business. In this case, I'm going to use um, drug addiction because I'm actually going to use AdGraft as an example. So I'm going to search small business drug addiction. And then it pulls up the list of SBI or STTR study sections. Now, let's look at the next slide. Um, when, we, we, when we look at these, it's important to remember um, that this is for research information only. You don't contact these individuals. Um, this is for you to, to help you decide which institute or center. Now, AdGraph is a perfect example because um, they are using a therapeutic platform to treat cocaine addiction. So we're really talking about two potential ways we could go. They could go with the drug delivery platform or they could go with the addiction side. And it sort of depends on which they're focusing on more in their proposal. So if we looked at when we did drug addiction and SBIR, we came up with the list of study sections. One of them is the ETTN number 11. And you, when you click on the study section, it gives you an overview of what they are interested in. It gives you topics that they're interested in, okay? Now, this is where you need to be careful. See all these other study sections down here? You can click on them, but they might not be SBIR. So make sure you search SBIR. Then what we do is we go and we look at the list of reviewers. Now, these are the last three study section meetings of this study section. There is no guarantee that these people will be on your study section, okay? In fact, one of the challenges that NIH or that CSR has faced over the last couple of years are people used to get on a study section and sit on it for a long time which meant when you would resubmit an application, uh, you were essentially responding to their comments and they'd be like, oh yeah, they fixed them. Well, now people rotate off and on study sections so, so frequently, it's actually made resubmission slightly more dis difficult than it used to be. Um, resubmission used to be like a, a, a no brainer win and it's just not like that anymore. Anyway, um, so this list, everybody who was on the study section at that meeting, and you can see there are some people here who are private sector, right? Consultants, um, there might be, usually there's some more startup people, but uh, like Annalisa said, they tend to be more on the scientific side. So we look at one meeting and then we might go back and look at another reviewer roster for another previous meeting. And again, so I made a list here in this table on my slide of the expertise that was on that roster, okay? Then we go look at BST10, same thing. Their focus is on delivery platforms of therapeutics. So that's more on the platform side. Here's who's on their study section. And then we went and looked at, I went and looked at BRLE which focuses on um, disordered behavior across the lifespan. Here's who's on that study section. So depending on what the focus of the application is, you could target the study section. Another great example is I have a client that does, um, that has uh, Alzheimer's, uh, essentially it's a decision support tool for use in a clinical setting. Uh, we submitted it once through Alzheimer's disease they really liked it, but they didn't understand the technology piece. 
and then we submitted it through digital health informatics. They really like the technology, but they didn't think people would use it for, for Alzheimer's. So do you see how you could go to two different study sections depending on what the emphasis is and you're just trying to find the sweet spot. We actually never found the sweet spot, um, but that's a way to sort of look at, look at study sections. Okay, more questions. You wanna talk about that more in depth? I would like love to talk about it. It's one of my favorite things, uh, but we'll do it offline. All right, Roland, tossing it to you. Okay. Uh, I was, uh, <laughs> I forgot to unmute. We have time for a few questions. We're doing quite well with the time. Oh, great. Uh, do you, Chris, do you see the question from Taha in the chat? Yeah, so it is different. Um, so uh, NSF does use peer review. Um, the scoring system is different. The assignment system is different. Um, the you don't get a score from NSF. You get reviewer comments, strengths and weaknesses in different categories. Um, so it's not quite as um, quantitative as NSFs, NIHs. It's more subjective. Um, and honestly, the reviews from NSF are not as detailed as NIHs. NIHs summary statements are usually really, really insightful. NSF's not so much. Um, so they are different, but they are both peer reviewed. Yeah, one question that I have is you mentioned that you know it's uh, optional whether you request. Do you have general recommendations about when to request, when not to request? It's uh, honestly, I've, I've experimented both ways and I really think it's a crapshoot. Um, unless, so there are a couple of instances where, for example, that, that Alzheimer's, where we missed the mark the first time with the um, Alzheimer's with the neurological disease because they didn't get, get the data, the importance of data in clinical decision-making. Um, we thought, okay, let's focus and shift to these people because we thought, well, maybe that will help. We tried, it didn't help. Um, there are other instances where we might be um, trying to get away from a particular program officer. Uh, and so we try to shift to a different institute or center um, and so we use that form to request uh, assignment to another institute or center. Um, doesn't always work, but usually worth a try. I'd say I use that form maybe 50% of the time oh. and do an assignment request maybe maybe 50% maybe 50 of the time. And the rest, we just let it go. All right. And then you got a couple other questions in the chat here. Pay line. Um, so... Each institute or center sets its own pay line and the pay line is a moving target. And so the pay line is what Annalisa talked about, that threshold where they'll pay. So for example, cancer, you have to have like, oh gosh, like a 26 to, to be like considered for funding in cancer. Aging, you could maybe have like a 31, maybe a 30 and be considered for funding. Um, so that pay line is a moving target, but we do consider pay line when you're thinking about what institute or center to recommend or to request, we think about pay line. And we think about not just pay line, but competition. So NCI obviously has a ton of money, but it's a huge institute. So there's lots and lots of competition. So is there a smaller institute that you could go to that's somehow relevant that has less competition? Aging is a great example. NIA has said on multiple occasions, they can't get enough quality proposals to, to uh, give away all their money. They had a doubling in their budget. They want more quality proposals. So anytime we can, we I you know submit to aging. Um, smaller institutes or centers, uh, nursing is a good one that doesn't get a lot of quality proposals. So anytime you can kind of go away from those bigger institutes or centers, you're gonna have less competition and the pay line is likely to be slightly easier to achieve. But pay line is a moving target and it is never a guarantee you're going to get funding no matter what your score is until you have the notice of award in hand. All right. And Reggie, you asked about how new investigators are received. Your own colleague, Samir, might be the best equipped to answer that. Samir, do you have any observations about new reviewers and how they meld, meld into the panel? I was, uh, I, well, Robbie was just here and I was saying, I, I was like, I'm not sure how... Uh, new investigators uh, work um, if how they're received on the uh, SDR and SDTR. I mean, it is an R mechanism, as uh, was mentioned, but uh, they may they may not provide that um, 
that bump uh, for new investigators for SBI or SCTR applications. I, I, I have that feeling, but I'm not sure. I have to, I have to research that myself. All right, one, one last question then uh, from Jason. Chris, why don't you handle that one and then we'll move on. Um, do you recommend using an assignment form for resubmission? If it is a resubmission, you don't even need the form. The very fact that it's a resubmission will make it go back to the same study section. If you don't want it to go to a, the same study section, then you need to put it in as a new application and request a separate study section. But if it's a, re, if it's a resubmission, it will go back to the same study section. Your challenge will be, that the study section will most likely be at least 25% new people who will find new things they don't like about your application. <laughs> All right, great, we'll, we'll move on then. Um, and I will talk a little bit about formatting. And the one of the main things to remember here is that reviewers are very stressed. They have several proposals to read. Those proposals are thick, there is a lot of information. They're looking at like a ream of paper, 500 pages when you talk about several proposals to look for. So you are competing for their attention. You cannot uh, bury important points later on in your proposal. All the main points have to pop out right at the beginning, right at the top, or as scan scanning through the text. This is unlike a... Um, in an academic journal where you have the preliminary work and you lay a lot of groundwork in your documentation and at the end you lead to the inexorable conclusion that undeniably shows your project is worthy of support. You have to have that undeniable conclusion right at the top, popping out, uh, making it very clear what your main argument is, and then you support that. So it's backwards from a way of a lot of uh, academic information works. Main points have to pop out. If you need to develop some logic, which you should, and then you've got some main points that are embedded within the context of a narrative, sometimes that's critical. Uh, you know, find ways to emphasize those main points. Bullet lists for key items. Numbered items. You're constrained with text. Six pages, it's hard to squeeze things in. But if you've got three points and you want to squeeze them into a paragraph rather than to take a lot of white space, you can put a numbered bullet in front of each one. one a parentheses and then something, two parentheses and then the point, three parentheses and a point. And then the I, the reviewer, will naturally gravitate towards these numbered lists. They'll catch their attention first. That's a great way to catch attention. Uh, bullet points are great, but they take a lot of white space. So it's kind of a trade-off whether to do a bullet point or not because proposal space is so dear. Um, you can have callouts for main points. Uh, if you've got a quote from somebody or something that's really relevant to your uh, proposal, this is more in the commercialization plan later on when you get to phase two. But if you've got a customer with a really pithy quote that says how much they want the product, you can have that in a little box off to the side or embedded within the text. And that will bring attention to it. Anything that you can do to bring main points forward, that's, that's important. And make sure that the main points are clear first and then supported later, not buried in text towards the end. Uh, use active voice. Uh, a lot of times in uh, academic history and academic articles, you get passive voice. The thermostat was raised, the beaker was lifted, the burner was heated. Uh, instead say, you know, who did it? But use active voice. It's much more clear who's doing what. If you can go to active voice. Now, one, one real easy way to move your concept forward is to put content in subheads. You often have, well, you have to have the main headers. You have to have your three main sections of your research strategy, significance, innovation, and, and, and work plan. Uh, you, you've got to have those, or approach it's called. But you can have your own subheads in there, and those subheads you can label as you want. Don't label anything generically like summary or background or section. That's a waste of valuable space. The I reads the contents of subheads just like you read headlines and when you look, pick up a newspaper. When you pick up a newspaper, you see the headlines, you scan for them, and then you go to the article that interests you the most. Borrow from journalism. Use that technique in your proposal. So you wouldn't have the subheads that just say subhead or a summary that says summary, instead embed a clear summary of the text into the subheadings. Here are a couple examples here. Proposed technology can reduce infant deaths by 6%. 
If that's in a subhead, that will gain attention. If your subhead just says summary, that won't gain any attention at all. That wastes valuable space to impart the information. Hey, a summary follows. You have to read it. Instead, bring whatever content you can in pithy, concise form into the subheads. Graphics are one other area that I'll mention. Now, in, in um, your six-page proposal, you've got limited space for graphics, and you need to focus on the technical graphics. But in the significance and innovation section, if there's a way to embed a graphic that somehow conveys the value of your technology as compared to its predecessor, that would be a very healthy graphic to include. When in phase two, you have a commercialization plan and you need to convey the value proposition. You need to convey its place in the marketplace. You need to talk more about competitors. A good graphic will handle that. You have maybe about three seconds with a graphic to convey information. If your graphic in a non-technical section takes longer than three seconds to understand and requires a lot of reading of even smaller print caption, then it really hasn't succeeded well as a graphic. In that graphic, the generic graphic and not the technical one, you need to communicate the value, the advantage, the impact, you know, why your idea is such a great idea. If you can, it's nice to convey the user experience. Sometimes that's more relevant than it is at other times. Sometimes it matters. Sometimes it doesn't. Sometimes it's clear what the user experience would be. But if not, if you can somehow convey the user experience, that's good. And some key technological innovation. If you can look at a graphic and say, oh, I see what they're doing now that no one else has ever done. That's a great graphic. These are the kinds of things you want to go for in the early graphics. Also, mention... Uh, Use professional polish. Uh, crummy graphics used to work, but no longer work. You need a level of polish now people are expecting. It, so you want it to look professional and polished. And um, just as you test your text with any other reviewers, text your graphics with other people, show them to people. It takes a long time to develop a really good graphic and a lot of in iterations. The really good graphic is one that you look at it and say, ah, I get the picture right away. You see it, you understand what, what it is, you understand what's important. And the reviewer says, hey, this is really important. I want to read more and people have to have this. And to get that, you often have to test a graphic with people and see their confusing responses and then adjust your graphics so that you can alleviate the confusing responses and anticipate them. So the obvious graphic hides its own expertise to develop. An obvious graphic looks so easy that you think, well, that shouldn't take any time at all to develop, but they really do. It's a hidden amount of time that's taken. All right, you want to avoid making anybody, any reviewer play the graphics guessing game. And so we're gonna play the graphics guessing game briefly now. This is an example of a hypothetical graphic for a hypothetical technology that I've genericized from several in reviews or in, in proposals that I've read. But it's typical of the kind of graphic that you see. You look at this and it doesn't do a lot to convey the user experience. It doesn't do a lot to convey the value of tech, the te technology. It doesn't do a lot to convey competitive advantage. In fact, you wonder what in fact it does convey. There are blobs, there are dots, uh, there's a bar, there are some arrows, so the bar seems to have some impact on the blobs. Maybe this is petri dishes, maybe it's, you know, hot and cold sunspots or something. Maybe it's a retinal scan of someone who's been staying up too late working on a proposal. Who knows what this is? It really isn't clear. You don't know what the bar is, you don't know what the arrows are, arrows are. you don't know what uh, the dishes are. So actually they are Petri dishes, but even if, even if you knew that, you still wouldn't know what the technology does. So an example of an improved graphic, oh, and sad to say, this is, you know, I've seen these graphics very much like this. An improved graphic might be something like this. Here's what the first graphic is intended to represent. This is a gene splicing technology in which you can splice genes into a plant so that they will emit or so that they will reflect certain infrared signals in such a way that a drone can fly over, it can beam down the IR signal, it can detect the response, and if the plant is stressed, it will know that. It can then send the stressed information to a data station, that this data station can compile all that information and send an analysis to a farmer. 
the farmer can say, oh, I can see where my field is pretty healthy, but I'm beginning to show a little bit of stress in one quadrant. I better do something to that quadrant to address that. And you know, when they've got that kind of targeted technology that far in advance, a lot of great things can happen to the plants. The farmers can reduce stress on the plants, you know, increased yields, all kinds of great things can happen as a result of that. This graphic, you can look at and, and very quickly get the idea of what the technology does, how it works, how it could be valuable. The previous slide, no, you could never get that. So uh, any, any questions on graphics? Oh, we're gonna talk a little bit about next steps, but before we go to that, um, any questions I can answer about graphics? And I can't see the chat screen right now. So Chris, if there are any in the chat, maybe you could tell me. No, there's none in the chat, but wow, is that a great example you just gave? Because <laughs> I never got that from those dots. <laughs> yeah, yeah, you wouldn't, but you've seen those kind of graphics too, right? Just oh, blobs yeah. and lines and, and yeah. you know, dense graphs with lots of, lots of charts in them and you know they, yeah. they don't quickly convey what what's all what it's all about no i think another great place to use charts and or graphs or i mean sorry charts tables is uh, when you're talking about setting up a study you know how many how many rabbits are in group a how many rabbits are in group b who will receive the intervention who won't so i think it's important you had some good information there yeah another point i'll mention is you know don't make the text in the graphics so small you can't read it if the text in the graphic is that small, don't have the text. It only annoys the reviewer. All right, uh, let's go ahead now. You know, we're, we're about at the end of today's session and of the sprint. So you know, you know, many of you are well on your way to a proposal. I've been really impressed with the group and the, the progress that you've made and the level that you're showing so far, the maturity of your, your work and your thought. There's a lot of work to do, as I hope we've made you aware, and there's a lot of support available to you. So next we're gonna talk about what kind of support is available to you. And there are three centers. The Polsky Center offers support, Northwestern offers support, and the FAST Center offers support. So each one of those is going to talk a little bit about the support that's available to you and how to access it. And Ellen with the Polsky Center is gonna talk first. Great, thank you, Roland. I know all of you um, from the University of Chicago have already taken advantage of a lot of the Polsky Center resources available, but I did want to reiterate um, some of the groups specifically within our center that will be great resources for you moving forward. Um, our Polsky Science Ventures team is definitely the, the lead on supporting um, startups that are spinning out of the university. So, um, with our programming team, we operate the Compass Deep Tech Accelerator with Polsky Science Ventures. I know AdGraft is a recent alum of the Compass, um, but this is a, a really incredible way to receive structured, one-on-one, -on -one, individualized support around all sorts of facets of launching a business, but including SBIR, and we're hoping to build more of that into the Compass programming in the future as well. Um, and then... An upcoming funding opportunity is um, the George Schultz Innovation Fund um, that the Polsky Center operates, um, and that has um, cycles in the fall and the spring quarters. Um, we are making some changes to the Innovation Fund in terms of how teams apply and are selected, so please stay tuned for those updates. They're um, kind of in the midst of being finalized right now, so that information will, will definitely be shared out to you. I'm happy to connect you with any of the team members who run these specific programs. So please feel free to use me as a point of contact and then I can connect you accordingly. Um, and then many of you are also connected into our intellectual property um, supports through the Tech Commercialization and Licensing Office. Um, that is the team that will work very closely with you around IP protection. Um, they also are a great resource regarding SBIR. Some of them have served as reviewers um, and so can provide some of that additional support as you're thinking about um, kind of how you incorporate your your IP into that proposal. And then finally, we do have office hours um, with SBIR consultants. Annalisa is one of those Polsky mentors um, who works with um, individuals at the university. Um, so I've linked the form here where you can sign up to receive the newsletter that outlines when the mentors um, have office hours and so that you can sign up there as well. But again, I'm happy to be a point of contact and connect you to, to these different groups within the center to make sure you're accessing the resources that you need. I think Northwestern's up next. Sonia? 
Yes, I'm Sonia Kim. Um, I know many of you at Northwestern, but not all of you. So I'm part of the New Ventures team at the Innovation New Ventures office. Um, let me put my video on here, sorry. Um, and with me, I think Lisa Dar and Alexander DePaz are, are on the call as well. We make up the New Ventures team at Invo, and we are probably the best people to contact for any of these resources that you see listed here. The first of which, um, many of you are already in contact with your invention managers at Invo, but this is like really a critical part of the tech transfer portion um, at the university. So um, if you haven't been in touch with your IM regarding you know, future options and licenses, it's great to get them, um, you on their radar so they know what's coming down um, the pipe. Um, and then the other things that I'll mention also is just supplemental SBIR office hours. So on top of um, utilizing the FAST Center for um, SBIR consulting, Invo also wishes to you know, support that further. So um, you should be aware of that as well as additional um, resources. So this is really meant for companies that we qualify as stage zero. So these are companies that have been incorporated for less than two years, have less than five FTEs and have an active option or license with the university. Um, and so these are the toolkit subsidies, which are reimbursements for certain services like website development and logo branding, corporate attorney fees, that kind of thing as well as access to core facilities at the university um, and mailbox rental. And um, the last two here are essentially, if you're looking for a lab or office space, um, we have limited, um, but some available space in Evanston. So if that's something that you're interested in, please let us know, as well as additional funding outside of SBIR funding. Um, the university does have a gap fund. Um, it's a $10 million gap fund called the Next Fund, and that's kind of an ongoing rolling basis. Um, so if that's something you're interested in, uh, please contact us as well. I'll stop there. All right, Shelly. Okay. The FAST Center as well can provide you additional application help. Um, we can provide you some one-on-one. -on -one. So if you're currently already uh, enrolled in this class, if you're one of the eight teams, feel free to contact um, your the the leader, your team leader that you've been working with. So they're the um, email addresses or myself. Um, if you're auditing the class and you haven't registered with the FAST Center yet specifically, um, there's a website there you can, uh, or you can go on the FAST Center website and um, you can get it through there, but you need to register with the FAST Center and then we can also offer you one-on-one -on -one support and we'll match you up with the right consultant depending on what your needs are and what your area is. So just contact us. Um, there's also some general office hours that we have, and you can sign up for um, a meeting through that. But um, feel free to just reach out and contact us. We can answer questions, we can give you some overall strategy advice, or we can um, help you review specific portions of your application. And Shelly, that's anyone in the state of Illinois can request help? Correct. Anyone in the state of Illinois is uh, eligible for FAST Center help. All right, well, we're at the end of our time. I hope this has been valuable. I've really enjoyed working with all the teams that we've been working with. You've got some great ideas. You've got some great technology. You have some mature teams. I hope to be continue continually involved as you develop your proposals. I'd be glad to continue with support. We've got a number of mechanisms for doing that, but good work, everybody. And I wish you the best of success in your SBIR efforts. Yep. Thank you very much on behalf of the FAST Center. Thank you for participating and we look forward to hearing from all of you.